So, um, my name is Guillaume Book. Uh, I actually work at the McGill Genome Center. I mentioned that to you yesterday. Um, it's my first participation in these workshops, but I've used the slides in the past, and I was telling these guys I feel like it was my duty to actually contribute at some point, and, and uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, you'll see this morning, uh, so I'm, I'm doing two modules with you guys, small variant calling and, and large variant calling. But we're going to touch a lot of the stuff that's been seen yesterday as well, and I'll put that in context. So hopefully uh, this morning session will, will really sort of, now that you've gone through all of the steps yesterday and slept on it, uh, hopefully a lot of that is going to come together in, in my model, in my presentation. Um, I also didn't want you to cheat with the, the slides, so I gave them just this morning. So now it's all going to be, uh, you know, you'll have to follow with me uh, the, the presentation. Um, so, uh, so typical slides, yeah, feel free to reuse uh, and share these slides. Um, <clears throat> so what I'll be talking about uh, in this first module, small variant calling and annotation, um, well, it's better on the slides than on the screen, but it's really this idea that once we've mapped all the reads onto the reference, uh, one of the, you know, the, the, the key thing that we're interested in is actually identifying these places that are variant. The reason why we're sequencing different genomes is because we're interested in really being able to pick up uh, the sites that are variable, that are different between the different individual. Uh, this is relevant in different disease. I don't have a lot of slides on the motivation for why this is important, but it's really one of the main, uh, main goal of these resequencing experiments is to identify sites that are variable like this. So the objectives uh, of what we'll cover, so quite a lot of things. So uh, again, if it's not clear what is very common, hopefully it will be clear uh, after, uh, after this module. Understanding the very basic principles of how, how we do variant calling. Um, so know what's important. So when you're doing variant calling, a lot of the things that you were doing yesterday Maybe you don't know, but they have a big impact uh, on variant quality, and that's exactly what, what I'll show you in this module. Uh, I'll show you how to filter and annotate variants, and, and all of that is relative to small variants, so single nucleotide or short, uh, short data. So basically, and, and within the practical, starting from the band file, similar to what you generated yesterday, be able to call variants and annotate these variants. Learn about the DCF format. So just like yesterday, you saw the TASQ format, you saw the BAM format. So we're going to go over the variant call format, which is DCF format a little bit. Uh, visualize the SNF. So this is a lot again. We, we've done a lot of the work yesterday, and now you're going to be putting that together to, to hopefully uh, make sense out of it. Um, <clears throat> so I, I like this slide. So this is from from senior bioinformatician uh, at the Genome Center. I like it because it's, it's, it's just an overview of, of some of the steps uh, when we do variant calling. So to begin with, so you start a, a little bit like you did yesterday again. You start by cleaning up the reads. You, you trim the reads. In some cases, you clip adapters. Uh, the module two, which was this alignment, aligning the reads. Uh, this is really at the center of variant calling. And once you align the reads, then you, you really do the calling of the variants, uh, you annotate the variants, and you can call uh, the structural variants, which is what we're going to be doing today. And in parallel to that, of course, you're collecting a lot of statistics. Um, but I, so without looking in the slides and without cheating, there's actually something that all of you guys forgot to do yesterday. So what's the first thing you have to do for this pipeline or for any pipeline like that, actually. What's the first thing you have to do? I'm sorry? Well, okay, fair enough, after that. So what's the first analysis step that you have to do with any of these pipelines? Yes. That's right, so we have to look at the data, right? And that's one thing, so because, so I work in a genome center, and if you get the sequences from us, they're perfect. <laughs> Not true, I mean, it's sort of true. But it's really key to look at your data at every step along the way, but especially at the first step. So when you get FASTQ files, you have to look at them. It's 
especially if you're doing, depending on what you're doing, if you have multiple samples, if they were generated through time, if you're getting data from the internet, you have to look at that data before you do any analysis, because otherwise, you don't really know what you're going to get. If one of the samples is really horrible quality, for instance, you might get all sorts of weird things down the line. So, I mean, I don't know if your background is, is to work in the lab, but it's the same thing. You have to, along at every single step, you have to look at what you did and what the data looks like. The first step being the most important is, is this quality control and, and look at it. I, in, in the lab, actually, we'll go back and look at the, the quality of the, of the files that you used yesterday as well. So the main analysis step is really, and this is for variant calling and structural variant calling that we're going to be doing today, but again, this is really sort of general quality control, pre-processing, you know, based on that quality control, what do you do with the uh, so you've covered extensively yesterday the mapping uh, of the reads, uh, and, and now, and then you sort of diverted into two other modules that were also very important, uh, but not directly relevant to, to the actual pipeline, because after you map, um, you do very calling, which is what we're going to be covering now, the calling, the annotation, and then after the break, we'll go to structural variant calling. Um, but, but these initial steps, um, I, I just wanted to reemphasize that they're really quite, quite important. Um, so I won't spend much time on this, but I wanted to, to just uh, mention this again. I'll go here. Um, <clears throat> so the importance of quality control before you start an analysis, it's important that you look at your raw data, because otherwise everything you do downstream maybe won't make sense. Uh, you know, where we're they all uh, sequence in the same protocol instrument. This is especially true if you're getting uh, data from different places. Uh, are there any technical issues affecting uh, some of the sample? So it's really important to get a sense of what your data looks like. Um, so one, one tool that's, ex you know, especially used and useful uh, with next generation sequencing data is FASTQC, and there's different uh, different variant of that tool. Uh, I, I ran that tool on the data set that you were using yesterday. Uh, so it's, and, and this is part of the output, but this is reassuring. So the data set that you were using yesterday is uh, pretty good. Uh, so if you run this tool, and this tool you can download from the web, or you can run it, uh, up, I mean, it's easier to download and run. It's also included in Galaxy. Maybe that's part of what you're gonna be doing uh, this afternoon with your Galaxy. So you can run this tool, you get basic statistics, it's hard to see how many reads that you have, what was the length of the read, but then you get all the other metrics like the quality of your reads, so this profile is sort of a typical profile with next generation sequencing data, where the quality of the read is, so here on the, on the y-axis you have uh, quality scores, I can't read, so I guess this is 30, or 20. can't read, it's even smaller here. Um, so I think this is 30. You have it on the slide? Yeah, 30, I guess, right? 30 is in green. So 30 is 99.9% .9 accurate. And this is a cumulative distribution of all of the, the your reads. Um, so this is first base and, and, and going down to the last base of all of your reads. And you see that by the time you get to the end of the read, the quality distribution, you have some reads that have much lower quality. So when you do this trimming step, uh, is, is something that actually removes some of these reads. But overall, you know, this is this is pretty good, and a lot of the aligners and of the variant calling can take that into account. Uh, so this was the first read of your data set. The second read um, <clears throat> is also not bad, but you see that one of the one of the summary report tells you that this is actually because with all the reads, they know where what was the position of the read on the slide, in the, on the sequencer. And what this shows is that um, there was a, you know, a number of region in the, in, on the slide that where the quality scores are not as good. Uh, again, this is not an extreme case of a bad data set. This just shows that the second read didn't have quite the same quality, uh, but still you know, pretty, pretty manageable. But this, these are cases where it looks more or less good, but again, I encourage you to run a tool like that on your data set before doing any analysis downstream, because if you get 
a lot of um, <clears throat> you know skewed uh, skewed values or something like that. Uh, you you want to know that before before you get started. Um, another another thing, <clears throat> and again, some of the tools downstream uh, will catch that and will. Uh, not be affected by the fact that there might be some adapter sequences in your reads. Um, but that, again, is, is a good thing to, uh, to, to watch for and to know that it's in your data. If it's, you know, so if you get samples back, what fraction uh, of your reads actually have adapter sequences? So all of that information uh, also comes out at some level from, from some of these QC reports. Um, this is just an example where the fragment itself, the read, well, this is sort of, sort of an old uh, Selexa slash Illumina uh, information, but the read itself might actually read through the adapter, and so your reads would actually contain the, the adapter sequences. Uh, one way to catch that is if you're, and, and that's coming out of these fast QC reports, is that if you have, it just looks for overrepresented sequences in your reads, and if you see that you have a lot of uh, of, of overrepresented sequences, you might have either duplicates or uh, or, um, <clears throat> or adapter sequences. Um, so this this tool in particular was mentioned yesterday by uh, in the de novo uh, for for assembly. Uh, so there's a number of, of tools that are out there that allow you to trim. So after you've done your QC, if you see that there's lots of adapters, or if you see that there's lots of reads of bad quality. Depending on your application, you might want to clean up your, your file, uh, cutting adapter sequences from, you know, so you just feed. We know what the adapter sequence is for Illumina sequencing, so you just remove reads that have uh, that adapter sequence. You can cut the bases off at the end of the read. You can drop uh, reads that don't have sufficient quality and so on. So uh, this is just, a, I guess, a heads up that this step is really quite important, especially looking at your data, making sure that your data, your set, your different samples are comparable. You don't need to be perfect. But yeah. Yes. CTK. Yes. So the, the way I mean, so personally, so I mean, this this step is pretty simple. It's, so we selected the one based on usability. So you look at the options and what you want. There's no any way it's sort of there's no fixed criteria of what you should be removing. We ended up picking this one based on usability because just the options of the tool and what it allowed us to do and how we could run it, it was more convenient. But this step is not there's nothing too fancy here uh, where you're just really like removing reads that have this property. Right? So it's it's pretty pretty straightforward. So. Yes, definitely. So I mean. Uh, but but again, it's real. Yeah. So, but it's 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 that's exactly right. In my mind, you know, every time you do one of these analysis steps, you look again at your reads or at your map reads. How many are there? How many did you remove? Right? Because sometimes you misunderstood the parameters and you ended up cutting ninety percent of your reads, right, or something like that. So you want to know what you've done at after every step. Um, <clears throat> so. Well, so any question on that part? Again, I didn't want to go into too much detail. Yeah. Are the Well, repetitive would be normal. Sometimes with duplicate, you know, so remove duplicate was one of the steps that we did yesterday. So these are PCR duplicates where it's exactly the same start and end. Uh, so you can do it at the left after mapping, which is actually a good thing, but you could also detect it here. Uh, so, I mean, it's easy, it's better to remove the duplicate after mapping, but you would already see it in the fast queue that you have lots and lots of sequences that are right in there. And you, no, no, no. So those, those are the ones. And again, uh, so it's initially it was very important to do these uh, filtering steps because. The mapping and the very calling were very much affected by that. But now, uh, to be honest, like the trimming step uh, is not necessary anymore. Because
as a lot of the variant problems take into account the quality score and won't weight these bases. So you don't really need to do that. But it's still good to get a sense of what your data looks like, if anything. And it's also good, perhaps, to, you know, and a little bit like what we're going to be doing, you know, you can try with and without those steps, see if you get different results, and see if, you know, if you don't trim, how many variants do you get? And if you trim, how many variants do you get? And if you get 10 times more without trimming, you know, you should be a little bit cautious about this. Yes? That's a good question. I mean, so the question is, is, it, uh, is the cleaning up important for small variant calling or for large variant calling, structural variants? By the time we'll get to structural variants, there's a lot of false positives there to begin with, and those false positives, for the most part, are not because of the quality of the read. So I don't think it would affect the structural variant calling as much as it, as it affects the small variant calling. Small variant calling is actually pretty robust pipeline, uh, and if you have bad data, it, it might lead to, to, to not so good results, but it should be giving good results. So there, I think cleaning up your data has a bigger impact than the, the structural variant calling. I mean, structural variant calling, what could it, well, we'll get to that in a bit, but would be chimeric reads and things like that, or, but that's, that's not what you would easily be able to clean up in this uh, trimming state. So good question. So, I mean, we've had lots of these questions. If you, you look at FastQC and you don't know whether it's good or not, right? So, you know, the first one you get is that you, you'll get some orange and you'll get some red, and is that a problem or not? The gamers in particular are hard to interpret from my perspective. I say it, I think the best approach to that is do it two different ways. Clean the data and then go forward with your analysis pipeline or don't or something like that and see if it changes the results. I think that's the best way of doing it. Because, I mean, for the most part, it shouldn't be affecting things too much. And, and it's normal to have some of these orange warnings and things like that. I think that's all fine. Uh, but it's more whether your samples all look the same. That's really important. Uh, it's more whether you have 50% duplicates or something like that. It's right? not necessary to have all the green. No, no, no. So we almost, I mean, again, like here, this is actually absolutely, even this is fine, right? If you compare the read one distribution of scores with read two, there's a bit more lower scores, you know, that are coming from this particular region of the slide. You could remove them, but I don't think it would affect very common, right? But, I mean, you can try it with and without, and then depending on, you know, whether, you know, whether you want, you know, you really care about any false positive or not, you Yeah. Is the sequencer to provide some information, like summary about the events, so you can get some information on whether the data is good? So I know that we run FastQC, and, and when we provide, as a, as a sequencing center, we provide that. But so the same type of output. I, but again, it's really easy for you to do it as well on your own. So if it's not provided, I encourage you to do it because, you know, and then you can ask questions. How come? You know, again, you, you do expect this type of profile where the quality decrease, but you know, if you have, so here I'm not showing it, but there's there's statistics on the length of the read, right? If you end up like having shorter reads and longer reads, you know, there might be something that was mixed up and things like that. So it's really easy and definitely worth your time to look at the data that you get before you start getting. Okay, moving on to, to the actual module. Um, so SNP and, and variant calling. Uh, again, the, the goal of this is uh, yesterday you mapped, you, you explored IGV quite a bit, but the goal of this particular module is how do we identify uh, sites like this uh, where clearly, so this is a tumor sample and a normal sample, so you see that from the same individual and you see that there's a variant. All the reads sort of point to a difference in the, in, in the normal sample here. Um, 
looks easy if you look at it this way. In practice, uh, it's a little bit trickier. Um, so, <clears throat> the, but the main idea is, is what you can guess from, from the, the previous slide itself. Um, actual variance, you expect many reads to, to, to point out that there's a difference. So we look for sites where you have many reads that support uh, a variant at that position, and that's going to distinguish from sequencing errors that are sort of, you know, 99.9% .9 accurate sounds like super accurate, but that means 0.1% errors, and you, there's so many reads and there's so many positions that there's actually lots and lots of errors. There's millions and millions of sequencing errors in your data set. Uh, but those errors should be all spread out throughout the reads. So we look for positions where multiple reads uh, point to different. Yes? So, you know, that's, you know, that's, you know, so, no, because we're looking for these errors here, right? So we could do error correction in a way we use the reference, or, or sort of, I mean, this would be, so the, Error, so this is a site that actually has both haplotypes, right? It has the G and it has the A. So you wouldn't want to try to combine and merge them. Every read in this step, every read is mapped individually to the reference genome, and afterwards we, we actually look for these differences as opposed to sort of collapsing them. Because in the de novo assembly problem, the challenge is to, you know, know, because you don't have the reference, you want to know what reads go with what reads and start putting them together. Yeah, but you just you know, the of Well, but there's, there, again, I mean, this is basically what we're going to be doing with the variant column itself. These will just simply be ignored. So in a way, that's sort of a, you know, error correction. This is saying, you know, this is a T. So we'll get for every position, we'll know, you know, we'll have an actual call that says this is very, very unlikely to be a G at this position. But this is exactly what the variant calling is going to do. It's going to give us for every position the probability of the different variants. I mean, different. Um, so this, <clears throat> so I'm not going to go into this in much detail. I'm putting that up just to, to scare you a little bit for you non-mathematician. Um, <clears throat> so this is, but this is still uh, the way variant calling is implemented. Yeah? Uh, to go back to the previous slide, yeah. what, what, what question I guess was, I guess that's the question, the lowercase a versus small a. That's a good question. I think, I think he did it for, for confidence in the It might be quality score. Right, so based on quality, you actually have a capital A or a small a. In, in IGG, this was shaded. Yeah. But I think you represent the same thing. Another question was, like, okay, so why do we have so many fragments aligned to the one that happens? So, so, we, we do, but, so for variant calling, I didn't go into that, but we do need to cover every position, you know, Typically, 30x is, is the target. And the reason for that is because if we only cover every position one time or two times, we won't, have a, we won't be able to tell that this is a sequencing error or an actual difference in the gene. So typically, whole genome sequencing, we have a target of 30x. With exome sequencing, it's even higher. It's 100x. And the reason for that is to, to get exactly that. Sufficient reads covering every position such that we can distinguish errors from And, and this is the main, the, I guess this slide is pretty important because this is really the main, uh, the main idea of how uh, variant calling is implemented. It's going to take into account the number of reads that observe a difference. It's going to take into account the quality score of every position. Uh, so that's what I have on, on this slide, uh, which again, we don't need to, to go into too much detail. Um, but basically, uh, you know, this is going to compute the probability of any particular genotype given the data. So given all of the reads at that position, what is the probability of, uh, of every uh, genotype? 
And this, it, you know, one thing that, that makes this more complicated is that if you're in the human genome, there's actually, it's a diplo, diploid genome, so there's two, uh, two haplotypes, so you have to, just like we saw in the previous slide here, you know, it's not that it's a G or an A. At that particular position, there's probably both a G and an A. Right. <laughs> well, X and Y are, are tricky, uh, for sure. So in terms of, and a lot of times they have to be run separately for reasons. So a lot of times, very polyomics and Y are different than all of the other ones. <clears throat> um, but again, uh, yeah. so. So, you know, I, I don't want to spend too much time on this if, if, if you're interested in the detail. To me, the main point is, how is this done? So this is integrating uh, all of the data at a particular position uh, to provide, you know, a score, a probability assignment for every particular genotype at a given position. And this incorporates information about the number of reads uh, that are supporting a different genotype and also uh, the quality score that are here because, um, again, this takes into account um, the fact that you are making errors and so on. So it's going to do a little bit like what we were saying. It's going to make a difference between uh, sequencing errors and actual variants. Um, so, and this is the place where I said trimming used to make a big difference. It doesn't as much because now that these, uh, these particular software, this is the one that we're going to be using, which is the, the GATK pipeline and framework, they take into account the quality scores of the base. So even if you don't do the trimming step, those particular bad reads or bad base will not be counted much into the confidence score. So that, uh, uh, that's taken into account. Um, <clears throat> so um, what we'll, we'll be covering more, though, is, is uh, you know, yesterday you, you, we talked quite a bit about uh, local realignment. We talked about the duplicate uh, marking, uh, base uh, quality recalibration, which we didn't cover, but I wanted to talk about a bit. And then population structure and imputation. So um, even if you have this, this method and this model that I talked about before, all of these steps when, uh, when you do the alignment and post-alignment are going to make a big difference in variant calling. So I, I, I wanted to go over uh, these different steps. Um, so starting with local realignment, which you saw yesterday. Uh, so this, uh, again, it was mentioned that around insertion deletions, uh, typically uh, reads are, are frequently, reads are not aligned very well. And this leads to, uh, to these types of patterns. So if we were doing variant calling on this uh, uh, type of data, this is alignment without the realignment step, we would probably call these as variants because there's lots of reads that are supporting a different at that position. Uh, and this is why it's important to do the realignment step, which is given that it looks like there's an indel here, um, you know, the alignment itself was done individually in every read, the realignment step now takes into account all of the reads at that position and does a much better job at alignment based on all of the information around that region. So this particular step that you did, we'll, we'll go over that in the lab. What happens if you don't do it? And what happens if you do do it? Uh, so this is one thing that improves variant calling. Uh, duplicate marking is another thing that you did yesterday. Um, so here again, you know, based on what I was saying, uh, the variant calling takes into account the number of observations, the number of reads that um, see a difference at a given position. Uh, the problem with, with uh, duplicates is basically this was one read that one had one sequencing error or, or one error that was then amplified uh, such that you have many reads but that they're all the same reads and they all have the same error. So if we do variant calling using this data, we're just going to make, we're going to call this a variant, but there's only one piece of evidence for that variant, and that's, again, wrong. Uh, 
So the variant calling, uh, I'm sorry, the duplicate marking is quite important because it really collapses that to, we have, you know, we have a suggestion of a difference here, but it's only one read that's suggesting that difference, and so that's going to be downweighted, and we're not going to call that there. So duplicate marking is another thing uh, that's that's quite critical, for especially for variant calling from DNA data. And RNA-seq is a whole other business, and you're going to hear about that in the next, uh, next few days. Um, Base quality recalibration is another one that uh, we didn't cover yesterday, but that I wanted to point out. Uh, so what's that? Um, so it turns out that you know I, the sequencers give you information about the quality score, but it was observed that uh, the sequencers make systematic mistakes. So they always overshoot the quality of their base. So the quality score that's provided with your FASTQ is off by a little bit. If it was off by a little bit, but it was sort of random, it wouldn't matter. But it turns out that it's off, and there's a sort of systematic mistakes that the, uh, that the sequencer is making. So it's making systematic mistake uh, relative to the position, so that's not the end of the world on the read, but it's making systematic mistake um, based on the dinucleotide. So you know, if it's, a, if it's a G that was just after a C, the quality score tends to be off, uh, more often than not. So this leads to small mistakes, but because there are systematic mistakes, then if you have lots and lots of reads that's making these systematic mistakes, it tends to, uh, again, lead to some false positive in the variance. So, uh, well, so this is also implemented within uh, the GATK framework where after you've mapped all the reads, uh, you can recalibrate the qualities. Uh, it's ba basically done by looking at all the reads and all the positions that are correct or incorrect and just changing the, the quality score. And it's just it's one more step that uh, they've shown, uh, and people have shown, I guess, improves the quality of very calm. So another thing to keep in mind, so you can add this base quality recalibration. Uh, and the last one uh, that I wanted to mention, and this is not always appropriate, and, and like yesterday we were just doing one sample, so if you're only doing one sample, it doesn't work. But I, yeah? Um, just to be clear, I understand. So this step would be the right one because the GNPK takes into consideration the quality score. So it's already, does, it already takes into account the quality score. But the quality scores provided by Illumina in the past few are off by a certain amount. So it looks at all the reads that are mapped onto the reference, and it adjusts the scores in the original fast few to say, well, this, you said the quality was 30. That type of base, you always make mistakes there. We readjust the quality of those base to 20. And then it does very well. So it improves a little bit. That's right. Yes, yes. And so this is just recalibrating, it's just tuning the quality scores that you had in the past. Um, so the last one, that the last thing that also improves variant calling, and this works when you have multiple individuals in particular, is this population structure and imputation. Um, so, so here's a little quiz to see if you're awake and ready. So using haplotypes. So suppose that there's only two haplotypes in the population. So, I mean, that, as you probably know, uh, we, we actually inherit whole blocks of our DNA, such that, you know, there's not so many differences in the genome, and typically, in locally, there's, there's high correlation between bases. So suppose that in the population, there's only two haplotypes, uh, ATG, and I'm masking the other bases, or CGA. Um, and then, when you're observing the reads, these are the reads uh, that you get. Or can you guess what is the value of it? T, correct, right? <laughs> so this is just so it's a, sort of a toy example to show that you don't need to only <coughs> infer the bases by looking at them one at a time. You can use information about flanking, uh, especially if you make assumption on the population that you have multiple So this, again, is sort of 
more advanced and more tricky, but just so that is another way you can improve variant calling is if you feed in information about other samples and you assume that you have this type of structure of correlation between the cases. But again, I mean, we're getting into the more advanced type of stuff. Um, you don't really need this, especially if you have 30x or 100x, but if you only have 5x or 2x, and that's what they've uh, shown, then even with 5x, with lots of individuals, you can still call variants using this type of information. Um, <clears throat> so again, if, so this is just showing the performance if you only have one sample versus having uh, but low coverage, or using this information about multiple samples and then still call. But this, again, is typically you don't need that if you have sufficient coverage. Um, so, you know, yesterday you were, most of the tools that we've been using are, are tools from this GATK framework, uh, the Genome Analysis Toolkit. Uh, yesterday, you know, starting from the raw reads, what you did in Module 2 is the mapping, the local realignment, the duplicate marking. Uh, we skipped this step of, of recalibration, but you can try out if, you, if you're interested. Um, and then what we're going to be doing in the module you know, uh, a bit later is, uh, is, is this step of uh, variant calling. And we're, I'm going to, you know, we're going to do it with and without this local realignment just to see uh, how different it looks and what we get. This stuff is this multiple samples integrative analysis that we will uh, cover in much detail. Um, in, a, in a real data set, because yesterday's data set was a small version of a data set, in a real whole genome data set, you start with files, uh, DAN files that are sometimes 200 gigs, that's roughly how much uh, the size of the files that you would get. And doing the variant calling with GATK there's alternative tools, sand tools, or, or free base, um, would take actually multiple hours. Um, and we go from very large file, the man files, to these much smaller variant calls. Uh, so that's what we're going to be doing, but on the smaller data set uh, in, in, the, in the practical. Uh, but before we do the practical, I'll also talk a bit about the annotation. I won't go into as much uh, detail here. So once we've called the variants, how do we do variant filtering and annotation? Um, <clears throat> so the file that we're going to get after the variant calling is a, is a VCF uh, format file. So, so a header file uh, with, with all sorts of parameters here and information about how the file is generated. Uh, but the key thing is it's going to be you know, one, variant, one position uh, per line. I mean, one position per line, with information about what is the reference at that position, what was observed as an alternative, what was the alternative genotype, uh, the quality score, and now this is a quality score not of the base, but the quality score of the genotype. So this takes into account, you know, how many reads were supporting a difference here and so on. Um, and that's converted into an actual quality score for your variant. Uh, and then there's lots of additional information about the allele frequency, the number of reads that were supporting that base, and so on, in the inner columns. Uh, if you want to look, and there's a link both here and in the, in the wiki uh, for more information about uh, that. Yeah? <coughs> I thought you had a question? Yeah. So it's comparable, but every so it depends on the mapping and it depends on the on the uh, variant color that you've used. They have their own formula that they produce a quality based on that. But depending on which variant color you use, you're going to get different range and different interpretation of those qualities. So you have to look at what is the definition. But I mean, the higher the better. You can look at the. the your distribution of quality score to see how many are good and how many are good. It's going to depend on the color. So the third marker and the third gets two and the That's right. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it can be possible how the program cannot design. That's, that's right. And, and 
Um, so again, if you so and there's going to be information in these extra fields that support well, in this you know that actually explains in more detail what evidence was observed to support these different things. But yeah, it is possible to have multiple uh, observations. I mean, there are trickier ones too, where uh, it's not just a single variant, but it's a it's an indel, right, where you go from a three base to to, to one to, to an expansion. But again, so I, I would recommend you, you, you look at the actual description of those, those comments. So I'll, I'll, I'll push forward because I, you know, we want to get to the exercise. Um, even though this section is going to take maybe a little bit longer, and I think the one on structural variant is going to be a bit shorter. So once you get uh, the raw variant calls, uh, they might have a lot of false positives. So how do we filter? Um, so there's two strategies. Again, <clears throat> sort of historically, it started with manual filtering based on different parameters. So based on quality score, based on depth of coverage, you might say, I want you know this. I want only variants that are very good score or very good coverage or so on. Um, so this this works works well. Of course, it's a good starting point. Um, there's also um, sort of more advanced ways now. You can filter your data. Uh, so you can learn the filters directly using the data itself. So GATK has what's called a variant recalibrator. Um, so this is a way of sort of automatically deciding what would be the right for, uh, what would be the right filters. And it sounds like magic. Uh, what, the way it works is that you just give it uh, lots of actual variants. So you give it the variants that are in DBSNP, or you give it the variants that are in HapMap. And you say, you know, based on these that I know are in my data, or that are no, or you know, mostly true positive, what are the right parameters of my there of from this VCF file? So there's really two options. You, I mean, this is fine too. You can filter based on quality and depth of coverage, or you can use some of those more advanced uh, machine learning where you give it uh, actual data of variance. And then it's going to tune it's going to tune its parameters automatically from them. Uh, so half map, uh, you know, this is a so this was done, uh, you know, very carefully. Uh, it's a proxy for false negatives because this, you know, these are high quality uh, SNPs. So you can give this set uh, as a training set uh, and and use that to sort of optimize the parameters in your file. Uh, DBSNP actually contains lots of real things, but also lots of false positives because people have submitted a lot of things um, in DBSNP, and a lot of common mistakes that you might make sometimes make it to DBSNP. Um, so, so both of these data sets are interesting for different things. Uh, but if you annotate your variant with this, and that's what I'm going to get to now, uh, it actually provides quite a bit of, of information on. on, on helps you identify your, your, your true variants. Um, so again, I won't go into this too much, but uh, this is this variant recalibration that I was talking about, which again is within the, the GATK framework. Uh, there's a clear pattern of, uh, of actual good SNPs, of the half map SNPs have patterns that are very different than the, 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 some of the false positives. So you can use that. Uh, to to calibrate uh, your variant call and then give even better score and better ranking of your variants. Uh, but again, this is this is uh, maybe a bit technical. So if you're if you're interested, you can look into that uh, further. Um, okay. So and now I'm moving on to the, the last section of the intro, I guess, to all of this, which is the uh, the annotation. Um, so this is a project that we were part of which, I don't know why that little square is missing, but we sequence 100 uh, kidney tumors, whole genome. In the end, we actually found 575,000 variants, somatic variants in those. So where do you start and how do you look? Uh, so, well, okay, this is weird. Well, this slide is behaving weirdly. I mean, this shouldn't have changed. I mean, the point I wanted to make here is just that 
out of all of these variants, only a subset of those variants were actually coding variants. And so having the annotation of the variant is quite important uh, and quite uh, quite key. So, yeah. I'm sorry? They're hitting uh, gene sequences as opposed to just being non-coding. So having, even once you have variants, and even once you have good scores of whether they're good or bad variants, actually having these annotation, annotation like this, this is a, a variant that's hitting a gene, of course it's gonna be very important to interpret your file. So uh, doing annotation of variants, and there's lots of tools, the one that we're gonna be using in the practical is called SNPF, and it does that, so it, you know, it, it, it's going to annotate your variants to say whether it's a coding or a non-coding variant. It's, if it's coding variant, it's going to annotate whether it's a synonymous change, a non-synonymous change, a stop gain, and so on. It's going to give you some basic prioritization. So, of course, if it's a stop gain in a gene, it's got a high impact, potential high impact. Um, otherwise, moderate, low, and so on. So having uh, this type of information of what the variant might be doing is obviously very very relevant. So, uh, so what we're going to be doing in, in the practical so is to go from the BAM files to the raw VCF using GATK, uh, and then we're going to use this, uh, in, the, in our case, using SNPF to, um, to further, well, we're going to use GATK to filter a bit, and SNPF to annotate the variants. So, uh, time to actually do it. Um, <coughs> 